Ready? Play. Welcome back to Painting Lines. Uh, last week, we responded to some comments on our social media, and this week, the Labor Cup just wrapped up. So we're going to be giving you a little overview of, of Labor Cup and then breaking down the tournament. Uh, with that being said, Aiden, what did you think about the team selections? So on Team World, we had Sarundalo, Fritz, Kokonakis, Shelton, Tabilo, and Tiafo. And on Team Europe, we had Alcaraz, Dimitrov, Medvedev, Rude, Sitsipas, and Zver. So let me hear your take on these teams. So, uh, yeah, when I when I was looking at the teams, I first had to, like, look at what the selection process is like because I was like, these seem like they don't really line up in terms of just the ranking. Yeah, that's and what I was thinking. So uh, apparently the way it works is the top three ranking-wise automatically qualify. I assume if they want to go. I assume if they don't want to go, they don't have to. But mm -hmm. top three automatically qualify. And then – the captains, so Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe, they also get three picks. So there's three captain picks and three automatic qualifiers. And I definitely feel like McEnroe went a little bit more bold with his uh, his choices here. I mean, I don't know if I would have gone with Kokonakis or... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I that's really the one that stands out to me the most. I think he was also a last-minute replacement maybe for Tommy Paul mm -hmm. because Tommy Paul wasn't playing. Yeah, I think but, Demon too. Yeah, exactly. So maybe maybe it was a replacement for for Demonar with the uh, the Australian there. Mm. But uh, yeah, definitely a little bit out there. And uh, also the fact that Nadal pulled out for Team Europe was a little bit of a bummer there. But yeah, it definitely just seems like Team Europe went much more with like the highest ranked guys, and Team World had a few out there picks like Tabilo and Serendolo. Oh, a hundred percent. And I'm not surprised that Nadal pulled out either. Like this is, is pretty customary at this point. I feel like McEnroe with his picks, why they were so bold was because he was actually trying to represent the world. Like we needed some South American representation and then some Australian representation as well. So maybe he's going for that. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. hundred percent. I yeah. mean, you look at team Europe and they get, the kind of all the guys were already from different countries. So works out for them. Whereas uh team team U or team world, I almost had a, what is it? Freudian <laughs> slip there where I said team U S cause it was mainly U S players. I feel like if it had uh, been just by ranking. Yeah, definitely. And then also, you know, just by sheer size of the countries too, like the U S has by far the most people. So it, it is, fair that they were the most represented country in the world for for that team yeah i mean i guess it, if this wasn't during the asian swing maybe you would have seen uh, a chinese player in there get the That's a uh, good point. most popular yeah. country in the world yeah yeah exactly so let's jump into what is the labor cup so real quick it is a tennis tournament that basically pits uh europe versus the rest of the world and it was founded in 2017 by roger Federer and named after the Aussie great, wait, hold on, you guessed it, Rod the Rocket, Laver, the Rocket Rod, yeah, so uh, the format's pretty interesting too, so like I said, it's two teams, world and Europe, each team gets six players, and it goes, it spans over three days, and there are three singles matches, and one doubles match per day, and the first team to reach 13 points wins the tournament. And what's pretty interesting here is singles matches are worth one point and doubles matches are worth three. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's definitely a values doubles much higher than, than the singles. It does. It does. So I feel like when I was looking at this, I came up with some themes of the tournament and teamwork is definitely up there just because you can see it. The doubles are clearly prioritized. And I feel like you get a bunch of people, um, you know, usually who are rivals coming together and rooting for each other and playing with each other. So it's cool to see that team aspect in tennis, something you don't normally see. And then strategy too, because like you said, we have two team captains. McEnroe just kind of went balls to the wall with his picks, but you really have to decide who you're going to match each player up with. So there's strategy involved and like who's going to play doubles, who's going to play singles, uh, that type of thing. And then the last theme, charity. So this tournament raises funds for charitable causes, most notably um, youth tennis. So there is 
a good approach to this. It's not just to get the best people in the world playing for, you know, the fans. It's it's for a deeper cause. Yeah. hundred percent about that teamwork though. Cause I mean, you look at team Europe and you're like, okay, Zverev, Sitsipas, and Medvedev all on the same right. team. Seems like it would be kind of a, a tense, I to say the least, but uh, I seems like they were able to work through it. That's a good point. Cause I kind of felt like these players have to fake enthusiasm for each other. Like, I don't know how genuine it is. I don't know how much, Zverev is rooting for Medvedev when he's playing and like low key hoping him to lose like that type of thing. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I feel like to an extent there is a, a different perspective you can take where like they're no longer rivals at this point. So mm-hmm. it's like, there's no points on the line and you're all just working together to win this charity event, essentially. So I, I, I hope that they can look past sort of their past uh, indiscretions a little bit. Yeah, this this would have been real funny if um, like McEnroe and Connors were playing together, because I know they used to hate each other. They wouldn't even talk to each other when they would play um, like Olympics and Davis Cup. It was just yeah. so awkward. Exactly. And then not really the same with Sampras and Agassi because they didn't hate each other, but I don't think they ever spoke. I yeah. think it was very cold. But it would have been interesting to see them, like see how they they relate when they're forced kind of into that atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like who's who's going to be the bigger person almost. And speaking of uh, McEnroe and Agassi, apparently next year they're actually changing the captains. So oh, yeah? it'll be, uh, I believe, Yannick Noah for Team Europe. And then Agassi is replacing McEnroe for uh, Team World. Nice. I like that move. I think McEnroe is getting a little old. Yeah, a little but, bit. Yeah, I think it's great to see Agassi back in because I think he's a more of a like a genuine, uh, nice guy than McEnroe. Like McEnroe was cool to see him like bring the energy and just kind of like strategize shit talking and stuff with the team. But Agassi, I feel like he's going to bring a new perspective and hopefully get a dub for Team World because, you know, hasn't turned out too well. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about but... talk about that? Yeah. Well, Team Europe's been dominant since the inception of this tournament, but Team World has won the last two. So they were going for a three peat this tournament. Yeah, pretty interesting. And uh speaking on that, like you said, they've been dominant, but I, I do think that at least the 2022 version was a little bit of like the fact that it was kind of a walk-off event for Federer, where they had all the big four there, all four playing for Team Europe. And those guys weren't necessarily in their prime. Uh, I mean, obviously Djokovic and, and Nadal were, but Federer was obviously on his way out and Murray was probably like number 50 in the world. So that one was a little bit iffy, but yeah, last year I'm pretty sure it was very dominant for team world. And so, yeah, Europe was trying to, trying to get back into it here. Yeah. Speaking of Djokovic, it kind of felt weird not seeing him there. Yeah. You know? I mean, I feel like it's another. It's weird to think about that because, yeah, I guess it doesn't really count as, like you said, he's only focused really on the slams and Davis Cup. Mm-hmm. But this is like a charity event, so I am kind of a little bit confused why he didn't show up in that aspect. But maybe he wasn't. Yeah, he would have qualified from what you said, right? Top. I mean, three, actually, or... no. And actually, no. no. He he wasn't an automatic qualifier, I guess, and so that's Ooh. why he wasn't picked. <laughs> Maybe he got slighted. Yeah, Borg Borg didn't. Uh, yeah. You, you know what's actually funny about that? I wonder if, like, Borg almost anticipated him being in the top. Well, because it's like you, yeah, I believe it's after the French Open that they make the cutoff for that. Uh-huh. And so Djokovic would have been very close to being in the. Uh, top three guys but i guess not close enough not close enough well some guy who was in there who is the best one of the best in the world carlos alcaraz i want to start talking about some of the highlights from the tournament i feel like he just dominated this thing and we saw him a lot on social media too just having a great time like i always saw him laughing joking around just kind of being his goofy self. And I feel like this is when he plays his best tennis when he's not under that much pressure and he's just letting loose. Yeah. He beat Shelton six, four, six, four Fritz for the, for the whole tournament, like for the decider of the tournament. Uh, and then he and rude played doubles against Tiafo and Shelton beat them. And to be honest, we were talking about this before, but I, this emotion, I've never seen 
so much emotion in Rude as I did while he was playing doubles with Alcaraz. I thought that was great to see because usually he's that stoic Norwegian, just kind of like, you know, straight face, ice cold, but he was... I feel like Alcaraz brought it out of him. Exactly. I was about to say that. He, like, yeah. fed off Alcaraz's emotion. Yeah, definitely. You know, but, I mean, just uh, going back a little bit, speaking on the the guys not being there, where was Sinner in this tournament? <laughs> yeah, great point. I mean, he probably just decided not to with the yeah. long season. And After being winning the U.S. Open, he's like, yeah. whatever. But it is kind of like he was definitely an automatic qualifier, especially at that point he was – I'm pretty sure already way ahead in terms of points for this year, right? Yeah, definitely. I think we're seeing a common theme with Center where he just doesn't like team tennis. <laughs> Maybe. But he they won the Davis Cup last year with Italy, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And the Olympics, he had tonsillitis. So it's not like he pulled out without a reason. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so we talked about uh, Alcaraz on Team Europe. Was there anyone on Team World that stood out to you? Yeah. Taylor Fritz. I feel like he's starting to own Sasha Zverev because he beat him pretty handedly, 6-4, 7-5 in this tournament. And this is the third time in a row that he's beaten him. So we're starting to see a shift in the paradigm because before they were going back and forth every other. Remember, it was a like a five on five, a five to five head to head. Now we're seeing Taylor just kind of break away. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, I don't know if six, four, seven, five is really like handedly like he beat him, but that's one break in each set. Like, I feel like it probably could have gone either way, but definitely, like you were saying, third time in a row is uh, a big deal, and it's it's not easy to do that. Like, beating someone over and over again is probably one of the most difficult things to do because they're going to just a- adjust to your game. They have more experience against you, and maybe Zverev just isn't adapting his game enough to, to play against Fritz. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, Fritz is just it's a good matchup for him. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe his girlfriend, whatever her name is, Morgan Riddle is getting into Sasha's head from Wimbledon. Maybe, maybe for the ladies, as she would say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that was a very slow, slight pause there. You definitely knew the name before that. I, feel like. <laughs> I had to think of it. Yeah. I don't want to give her that satisfaction of just knowing right away. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Can't, can't do that. But yeah. on the other hand, someone who's, been kind of disappointing in this tournament was Medvedev. He loses to Tiafo and Shelton, two opponents who I feel like he should normally beat in, you know, the regular season. I don't know if maybe this is just because of the weird um tournament team play, but what do you think about this? I don't know. I mean, I I agree that's pretty disappointing that he lost to both of these guys. I mean, maybe he's just uh in a funk after losing that match in the U S open, he's like, I don't know what to do. Like that was my chance. Maybe he feels like, and wasn't able to get it done. And now that kind of carries over into this. Yeah. Hopefully not. Hopefully he can reset here because well, let me, let me back up. Do you think Tiafo and Shelton played up? Do you think that it was more disappointing for Medvedev? Like, do you think he just didn't play? play as well as Medvedev does or do you think the other two really stepped up and beat him more solid Medvedev I think it's a situation where it's like in general you would expect Medvedev to win almost no matter what right Mm -hmm. but I I just feel like this time it just didn't happen for him like he just his strategy wasn't working quite as well as it should have yeah yep but there's also um, the possibility of like he didn't even care as much. I mean, I I hate to say that, but like maybe he just wasn't willing to grind as hard in a, in an event that's not for any points or money. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I, I mean, an exhibition match, will you? Yeah, exactly. Right? I guess like a, a glorified exhibition match. Yeah, yeah. And just overall thoughts on the tournament. Um, just kind of going through here. I thought the tennis court color was sick. Did you see it? It was like that yeah, the, black gray. Yeah. It's like black and white almost. Black and white. That was cool. I wish they would do that more often because I feel like I see it a lot in indoor, right? Yeah. Yeah. They go with that darker color. Yeah. And it kind of fit the whole Berlin vibe too. Yeah. What not that like kind of similar to, I want to say like Paris? Isn't Paris? I, I was thinking Paris. I think it is similar to Paris. Yeah. So it's, it's a cool setup. I think it's actually in the U.S. next year. Ooh, yeah. I want to say it's in San, San Francisco. San yeah. Francisco. Nice. So, nice. That'd be sick. 
I wonder if these have to be inside or out to, outside. Yeah. I feel like you only see these team tournaments indoors. That is true. I don't know why that is. Maybe. Yeah. I don't, I don't really even have a theory for that, but Maybe because they want it more of like a stadium, like NBA type feel where everything's very close and intimate. And they got the team on the bench. Yeah. I mean, there's also maybe like, they don't want any team to have a massive, massive like home court advantage or something like, <laughs> oh, we're playing in this area and like we know the climate here better than wherever and indoors. Maybe it's just that very controlled environment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, since it's in the U.S., hopefully we get a good I mean, not hopefully, but yeah, we'll get a good U.S. turnout fans. 100%. I don't know if this is an event that's like sought out after, like if people. I mean, here's I the know. thing. It's like you think about you live it. In like, LA, would you go? Would you go up for it or no? I mean, maybe. I mean, being from NorCal, I could probably visit people up there too. But also, like, I mean, just the fact that it's like the best players in the world. The automatic qualifiers are the top three guys from the world and from Europe. You're at least getting to see six of the best players in the world. So mm-hmm. that's always going to be a draw. It's like why it's expensive to go to the last few rounds of of major, for example. It's like because people want to see the matchups of these really top guys, even if they're not playing at their full extent, they don't care as much as they might yeah. in a grand slam semifinal. It's still cool to see them play. Yeah. Speaking of exhibition and like top players, I'm pretty sure Ben Shelton's playing in MSG in December too. All right. Just checked on it. It is Ben Shelton and Alcras playing at MSG. Oh, okay. That's sick. The garden cup is what they're going to call it. Yeah, I mean, Alcaraz, they he, they just throw him in there. They're like, he's going to be a big enough draw. He had that ne- Netflix event against uh, Nadal. Now that he's playing in the this in MSG, like he's just uh, they know he's going to draw a lot of people. I think he's just like not to compare him to Federer in terms of like his prestige, maybe of his career, but like he is that kind of guy right now where it's like he may not even be the best player in the world but he's like the most popular young guy for sure. Yeah, exactly. He's a showman, right? He's an entertainer. And 100%. I feel like Sinner doesn't have that same appeal, even though he may be better than him right now because he's not as fun to watch, plain yeah. and simple. And then you have Shelton. Shelton's also not the best American guy, but he's fun to watch. 100%. We're going to see a lot of personality is just spe- just uh, promotes your career almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, just another point on this tournament, something I'd mentioned before, but I thought it was really cool to see the players who are normally rivals, normally who like really want to beat each other on the same team, playing with each other, celebrating each other, and just acting like a team. And um, I think you don't really get to see that with tennis. And I do like how it brings out emotion from people too. Like, I don't know how much they really care about winning this, but I guess, you know, bragging rights if that's even yeah uh, i mean we, we yeah we kind of talked about it earlier with like uh, medvedev and uh zverev and city being on the same team but yeah it's just cool to see these guys kind of at least pretend to put aside their differences mm-hmm. for the for the camera and be be on the same uh same side yeah yeah like you you mentioned them i'm i'm thinking alcaraz and zverev they just played a grand slam final rolling garros against each other and now they're playing doubles together yeah exactly well speaking of doubles i feel like another takeaway is i got to hone in on my new appreciation for doubles here because i feel like before the olympics remember i wasn't really into doubles now it was just so exciting to watch and i feel like it's because of the singles players that are playing like i don't think i'd be as inclined to watch a you know professional doubles team versus like Alcaraz and Zverev, I'd much rather watch them, or like Sheldon Tiafo. I thought, I, yeah, I, I think I get where you, you where you're coming from on that. I think it also mm-hmm. has to do kind of though with like how we we are into watching singles players, and yeah. so it's like we see them transition over, and we're like, oh, this is fun to watch. I feel like if we were more inclined to watch doubles it would be like we'd start to learn more about the guys that play doubles and then we'd get more and more mm-hmm. into it, if you see what I mean. No, 100%. I know. And I just like the excitement too of it because doubles points, they, they're they known for being very short, right? Like it's kind of bang, bang. Well, these, I was watching, there were some hell of good points, man, with like 
um, just up at the net, you know, coming back, trick shots around the back. Shelton almost like squared up and around the back shot that was ripped at him. It was exciting. And yeah. you get the the energy too from teams, like two doubles players playing with each other. You just feed off that. Hundred percent. Yeah, and I I feel like it's it's almost like a celebrity match though. It's like you you're like these guys yeah. aren't usually doing this, and so it's extra cool. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that just with all right. Let me rephrase. With doubles being such a big part of the tournament, they don't pick doubles players, right? It's all singles players, and they make them play doubles together. I mean, you, to to an extent, you could argue that Kokonakis was a doubles pick, right? Because he's won a doubles Grand Slam. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you could. And then Jack Sock back in the day. Yeah, he was kind of a wild card there. And, yeah, Isner. I don't know if Isner qualified because of. Well, ranking. I think Isner's won a. Uh, he's won world. a few Masters 1000, I think, in, in doubles. Yeah. But. Yeah. And you're thinking like for world too, he's top ranked. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But, and then my yeah, last take. Jack Sock, I think, won a Grand Slam in, in doubles or at least mixed doubles, one of the two. Yeah, I think he's won a couple yeah with with uh with brian one of the brian bros right yeah 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 it's funny on their podcast they're like what is it 10 doubles grand slams equals one singles title i don't even know yeah I mean, there, there's like some kind of ratio because i know they're like, he's like well because they're nothing major none of them yeah. have won a major but they, they don't count jack's majors yeah i mean the funny thing about that is like you look at the brian bros like yeah if you think of the fact that they've won whatever, let's just say like 15 doubles grand slams, equate their fame to like a singles player. Like where would that line up? You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So they, are they the like same? a Boris Becker or something where it's like, yeah, they, they're like all time great, but like they don't get the prestige of like a, maybe like a Bjorn Borg or like a McEnroe. But yeah, I feel like McEnroe has be. like similar amount to Becker, right? Yeah, I think it's just about because they're twins. Like yeah, they have the kind of the marketable uh, yeah. aspect to them. Yeah, that's why Le- they're so well known. That. They're, literally, they're that. literally identical twins yeah. who play doubles together. That's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. And my last takeaway was just no points or prize money in this tournament. So like, why are these players doing it? Yeah, I mean, this definitely disincentivizes like lower ranked players who don't make as much money from playing in it. If they were asked, like Kokonak is stepping in is kind of a an impressive move for him, given the fact that he probably hasn't made as much money this year and loses out on a chance to go to China and play in one of these tournaments. I was going to say, yeah, and China's pretty close to Australia, too. So, you know, it could, it's an easy tournament for him. Yeah, definitely easier than playing in Europe. Yeah, yep. Highlight of his year is probably that big win against Tsitsipas. 100%. All right, you ready to uh, hop into segments, though? Yeah, let's do it. All righty, what's new in tennis? All right, I got some juicy news for you, Aiden, because I know how much you like this type of this type of uh, news. But, you know, we have another tennis power couple break up, unfortunately. Shevchenko and Potapova, they break up. They were actually engaged, which uh, is pretty interesting because they're both 23 years old. And the reason I even found out that they were together was – for the Italian Open, they had this huge photo shoot, um, like vacation in Rome type of thing that really put them on the map. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, no more, no mas. But I'm heartbroken. Side, I know, I know you care so much, but you know, someone's got to report the news. And on the bright side, we do have other people who are going strong, other tennis power couples. We got your favorite, Sitsi Boss and Badoza. <laughs> And Shapovalov and Bjorklund, Svitolina and Monfils. I'm actually they're they're married. I think they have a, a child. And then right now the biggest one I would say is Sinner and Kalinskia. Yeah, I mean I don't even uh, not to be disrespectful, but I've never heard of Bjorklund before. <laughs> yeah, I mean and then again yeah. I had never heard of Kalinskia before uh, Sinner started dating her. Just yeah, shows how much well, I really care about or not care about, but follow the wta yeah but yeah uh, yeah i think it's funny because right i think potobova is higher ranked than shevchenko but i I think we'll see some some breakout from shevchenko here you know revenge tour newly single yeah focus hyper focused (laughs) yeah i mean 
Yeah, not to be disrespectful to the WTA tour because they, they it's their own thing, but I just don't really follow it as much yeah. as uh, no, the know. ATP. I think this is funny because you have essentially workplace relationships. It's like this is yeah. no different from you know a big company. Like for example, my parents they both work for American Airlines. They that's how they met. They're married. Like it's normal to date within your company, but then you have athletes do it because this sport has a men's and women's version. You don't have NFL nfl players dating female nfl players or, yeah do they have you know, a i guess do nba players ever ever date WNBA players dude i don't know <laughs> i feel like <laughs> i feel, I like, feel like, like you no. should know eric it seems like your area yeah. of expertise oh uh, but you're the nba guy <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, um, I would i would go on a limb and say no yeah i know that uh i think Darren Waller was dating an NBA player or WM <laughs> dating a WNBA <laughs> player at one point. Yeah. Well, I do know Caitlin Clark is dating, I think, someone who was on the Purdue men's basketball team. Maybe he went. So I don't think he's in the NBA, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Enough relationship talk. What is yeah. your news of the week? Uh so speaking of the doll, we talked about him earlier and the fact that he didn't play in the Labor Cup, but Apparently, he's set to play in the Davis Cup Finals in Malaga, finally make his return again uh, after he had that brief comeback earlier this year. I'm just wondering, like, could this be his, like, wave goodbye to the, to the tour? It would be kind of cool if they they Spain did win and that was his last tournament. But it's weird because it feels like he was playing decent in the few tourna tournaments that he was back earlier this year. And to me, it's comparable to, like, where Murray was after his big injury, like he was number one player in the world, speaking of Murray and uh, had his big injury surgery came back. And for a few years there, he was probably hovering around like number 50 in the world. I feel like that's kind of where Nadal was playing before he like had to uh, take a step away again there. So I'm, it just seems like maybe he has a different perspective in terms of like, he is not willing to keep playing at that, top 50 level he's like i'm gonna retire unless i'm playing back in like a top 20 top 10 level yeah that's a great point because you have it, it, it's humbling to be that good and to be playing at that level because that's that's not how you want to be remembered that's not how you want to go out and i think murray was just he's he was younger than nadal when it happened so i think he still had a lot more fight left in him which is why he was willing to do that stick around there however in the 50s and just play tennis whereas nadal He's already at the end of his career. Why does he need to do that? He's accomplished so much already. Yeah, 100%. 100%. How about a bet of the week? Who'd you go for here? Yeah, I'm going Musetti minus 140 over Shang. Um, I'm just going with the better player here. There's really not much to it. Also, Musetti, fun fact, is two for two in finals. So he's won two. he's been to two finals and he's won two titles. So... Hopefully we can make it three for three. Shang's never been in a final. So I feel like he may have some nerves. He's got a lot of pressure. It's in China. So we'll see. I'm hoping for Musetti here. Yeah. I mean, funny thing about Shang was my bet last week was against <laughs> him losing in the first round in Nishikori. And uh, now he's playing in the final. And speaking on that Nishikori go. match, it was actually a great match. Closer than the scoreline. I think it was 6-4, six, 6-4. Four, six, four, but it was a pretty close match back and forth. But for my bet of the week, I'm actually going with the Hangzhou final, which is actually the inaugural year of that tournament. But we got an old dog in it, Chilich. I'm taking him mm. plus 110 over Zhang. Awesome to see this comeback from Chilich. I'm super happy to see him there. And to be honest, it's a little bit of an emotional pick. Like, I'm just so excited to see him in this final. I just really want him to win. So that's why I'm going with him for the year. Yeah, I'm shocked Chilich is in a final. I can't say I saw that coming. Yeah, I mean, he's had a brief resurgence here, it seems like. Maybe he can build into that in the uh, the end of the year. It'd be sick if he had an end of the year like uh, Dimitrov had last year where he makes a run maybe in, in Paris or in Shanghai. Yeah, is he – he's pretty damn close to retiring. So do you see him winning this and then hanging it up or no? Is this just part of his – I mean, he's 35, I think. So yeah. he may play. I mean, think of Vavrinka. Vavrinka is how old? 38, 39. Yeah. yeah so but I, Chilich I, could still play for a few more years. Definitely. I just think maybe if Vavrinka wins a the title, then he'll finally stop. I just think he hasn't been in that position. Yeah. But I, I, I like, feel like you also get that 
that taste of it, the win again. And you just want to yeah, keep going for it. Keeps like, you going. If he wins it, he doesn't want to be like, I have more to give, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah. You want to max it out for sure. Yeah. Like, I mean, you look at Murray at the end of his career, <laughs> he lost like eight matches in a row. I feel like other than obviously the Olympic doubles, but like singles wise, it felt like he was just losing every match. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, match of the week. Who'd you go for here? I went with a Labor Cup match, uh, Shelton beating Medvedev, just because this match was pretty damn good. It had it had a lot, you know, the classic Medvedev meltdown where he chucks his racket, and honestly, people say he should have been defaulted for it too. I know Shelton and Tiafa were talking to the ref about it. He wasn't, you know, no surprise. I feel like Medvedev kind of gets special treatment in these situations. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, he comes back and wins this first set in a tiebreaker. So I feel like if you're Shelton at this point, you're kind of like all fuzzled, right? You're thinking, all right, this guy, I should have won the match without even having to play the rest because this guy freaking chucked his racket, almost landed in the stands. Anyway, uh, grueling baseline rallies, big serves, great hands at the net, a uh, ton of celebrations, and ultimately a Shelton dub. So that was my match of the week. I was pretty pumped for him. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. I feel like defaulting someone in a Labor Cup match is just <laughs> such a kick in the nuts to the fans. Just yeah. because, like, it's not even a tournament. Like, why would you default him? That's that's my old thought. Like, I don't get complaining about it because in the end, you're there for the fans. In the, it, it, Like, in most tournaments, you're there for the fans, really, because that's who's paying for the prize money, really. Yeah. But especially in this tournament where it's for charity – and the fans are paying just to come see you play and you don't get anything by a default. Really? I just doesn't make, make that much sense to me. Yeah. So what do you think you have to do in labor cup to get defaulted? Like, do you I mean, you can cuss it's out still normal ref? rules. I, so I assume like if you just yeah. do something repetitively, you'll get defaulted. Yeah. So like if, if you smash his racket a couple times, cuss out the ref and then, smash the racket again you'll probably get like whatever set penalty yeah i don't know what of, the step ups are <laughs> exactly speaking of like meltdowns and defaulting where was rublev here i, I didn't even notice that until talking about mevedev right now that he wasn't in the tournament i mean i i guess not an auto qualifier Jeez, and uh geez. wasn't selected i mean you think of the guys that were selected that weren't in the top i guess city pos isn't maybe the most crazy stable guy but they also got rude and dimitrov kind of just cool presences to have there on the court with people yeah yeah what was your match of the week i went with uh chillich he clutched up uh, against uh, uchiyama in the quarterfinal kind of dominated the first set uh six two but then set two was real tight lots of chances for both guy to break but nobody got it done and then uchiyama ends up finishing it out in the tie break and then set three was just wild. Like Uchiyama broke Chilich at 4-3. So he had the chance to serve for the match. Chilich clutches up, breaks back, then goes down in his service game and has to save two match points on his serve, forces a tie break, and then closes it out in the end. So pretty impressive that he was able to just uh, keep calm and, like I said, clutch up there at the end. That must be all those years of experience under his belt. Exactly, exactly. Especially against like someone like Uchiyama, who definitely isn't as comfortable in later rounds of tournaments. Yeah, and I'm sure having a big serve helps. Too. Like Chilich, when he has to save those match points on serve, he's probably thinking to himself, all right, I got this, you know? Boom, boom. Where some people who don't have a strong serve could just be like shitting their pants. Yeah, to an extent. I also think like it's really interesting to think about these guys in – Asia and the fact that most of the tournaments are played in like very far away out in Europe and mm -hmm. in the States and places like that. And I remember last year we had Mochizuki out in Tokyo, make that run there, beat Fritz. And I don't think we've heard that much from him since then, but I think part of that probably has to go with the fact that it's expensive to travel out to Europe. It's expensive to travel, travel to the U S and it's not easy for some of these guys to get to tournaments outside of maybe China or Japan. So I wonder about stuff like that, where 
if their Asian swing was longer or if we had just uh, more tournaments in, in different parts of the world, how that would, uh, how that would impact these, these countries with lots of guys, but not necessarily close in distance to the, these tournaments. Yeah, exactly. And I wonder what the white space is, the white space is in Asian countries. Sorry, I like blended it all together. I'm like the white space is, but because there's an untapped market in Asia. And I feel like once you get more fans and more people willing to watch, we may see a bigger Asian swing. And it'll it'll be kind of like a break, I think, for the top players who don't necessarily want to play in Asia, who could take this time and rest, take a break, and maybe just have, you know, two fifties for guys who are not normally playing in other tournaments or even challengers. They can just play this. Yeah. I mean, well, another thing, like how many tournaments are there in Africa? I know it's like Jeez, think geez. of think of the how uh, many African Baratini, tennis players are there? Baratini won that one tournament in uh Morocco. Yeah. But other than that, what tournaments are there? And like there's so many places where it seems like there's just an untapped market of I'm sure talent. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I didn't even think about that. All right, and that's the show. If you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You can find us on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube at Painting Lines Podcast. Feel free to shoot us a DM or email us any questions or thoughts at paintinglinespodcast at gmail.com.